It seems extremely silly to read my own CV to you, <laughs> and, and, and maybe a little pompous to boot. So instead, I will read what Maurice Morris, he, it was pronounced Morris or Moisha Samuel, uh, what he wrote in his um, uh, autobiography, Little Did I Know, uh, quote, uh, We have with us tonight Mr. Morris Samuel who is well known throughout America and in the Bronx as well. <laughs> as the chairman of this evening, I will not bore you for long since we have brought Mr. Samuel here for that purpose. <laughs> With introductions like that. Okay. Uh, uh, Morris, Morris Samuel uh, has, has fallen down the memory hole uh, and uh, I'll speculate in my 24th slide uh, 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 why that might be the case. But in the first 23 slides, I want to show you uh, why uh, Morris Samuel uh, deserves to be rescued from the memory hole. He wrote 28 books uh, uh, of nonfiction, six novels, translated uh, an enormous number of works from the Yiddish, the Hebrew, the French, and the German. Uh, he was probably in the 1940s and 1950s America's most sought after public speaker. He traveled all over uh, the country and in fact until he married uh, for the third time, I'll get to that momentarily, uh, he, he didn't have any permanent residence. He just, <laughs> just lived in hotel rooms uh, for about 30 years. Uh, and, and I'm going to talk about Morris Samuel uh, biographically a little bit, then I'm going to talk about his particular contributions, and then I'm going to focus on one of his several areas of expertise. Okay, uh, Samuel uh, was born in Romania, uh, but left uh, as a child uh, to Manchester, England. He grew up in the Jewish ghetto of Manchester. He was born in 1895, so he grew up in uh, Manchester uh, in the years before the First World War. Uh, he, uh, uh, his father, as you can see, was a shoe shop owner, a very traditional Jewish occupation, and uh, he grew up in a Yiddish-speaking household. Later on, uh, he claimed that he only acquired Yiddish uh, later on in life as a 20-year-old, but that claim shouldn't be believed. Uh, a lot of what people write in their autobiography shouldn't be believed. This is one of them. Uh, in fact, uh, he may have acquired a taste for highbrow Yiddish literature then, but he certainly grew up speaking Yiddish, not remaining it. His English was perfect, uh, both in speech and in writing. Uh, there are a bunch of uh, reels of tapes at the American Jewish Archive in Cincinnati uh, that I'm looking forward to listening to the next time I go there. Uh, I'm afraid to say that the machine was broken on my first visit this past summer, but there are 36 boxes of material on Samuel, so uh, I was plenty busy for my visit. Um, Samuel won scholarships to uh, English uh, public schools, which is to say private schools, and uh, he attended the University of Manchester, but uh, never took his degree. He went three years and decided not to graduate. I don't know why anyone would do that, but he did, and he never seemed to regret it either. Uh, he moved to the uh, United States. Uh, he then enlisted and served in the Allied Expeditionary Force during the First World War. He served mainly in Bordeaux. He was not in the trenches. He was a translator. His French was... Uh, from school, apparently perfect, and we'll talk a little bit about his linguistic abilities, which were uh, uh, really uncanny. And he worked not only as a translator during the war, uh, but after the war, too, he worked uh, on the, the Morgenthau Commission, which was investigating anti-Semitism right after the war, specifically in Poland, and it was probably in that uh, capacity that Samuel uh, acquired his uh, disdain for uh, American Jewish leadership, of which Morgenthau was a good example, and also his uh, uh, a lifelong interest in trying to understand the causes of anti-Semitism. Uh, and he wrote several books uh, on that subject, including The Great Hatred, The Gentleman and the Jew, and Blood Accusation, The Strange History of the Mendel Bayless Case. Uh, 
Did he write those books in English? He wrote them in English. He did all of his writing in English. Uh, and uh, curiously enough, he even uh, responded to letters written to him in Yiddish and Hebrew in English. I'm sure uh, we, have, we have a correspondence between him and the uh, now almost forgotten Yiddish author Sholem Ash. But Sholem Ash was a very, very popular writer in the 20th century. Samuel, Maurice Samuel, was his translator in, uh, for a lot of his works, including Ash's uh, somewhat uh, controversial, no, controversial, uh, Nazarene trilogy in which he retold the life of Jesus uh, and, and Mary uh, and the family uh, in a way that really alienated, surprised, and even antagonized a lot of American Jews who were immigrants and the children of immigrants. And, and Samuel was actually his translator for two of those three books. Um, but even in Ash's correspondence, which is in Yiddish, Samuel responded in English. I, don't, I really don't quite know why. I'm sure he could have written uh, in uh, Yiddish if he had wanted. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, sometime, uh, everyone, everyone over 50, or maybe over 60, uh, will recognize the woman on the left, maybe a few people under 50, but I doubt it, unless they're Jewish studies professors, or Israel studies professors, that's Golda Meir, the fourth prime minister of the state of Israel. Standing next to her is uh, her lifelong friend, Mary Serkin. Mary Serkin herself was a prominent uh, uh, American Jewish intellectual, and, uh, 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 and she was also the daughter of a very, very famous socialist Zionist named Nachman Serkin. She and uh, Morris... Uh, uh, fell in love on the Jersey Shore in 1915. They had uh, what was for those days a torrid romance. In other words, they kissed. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then uh, they eloped. And then uh, the tyrannical Nachman Serkin forced them to annul the marriage. And then they carried on a on-again, off-again romance in letters and more than in letters for the next few decades. Had they remained together, uh, it might have been uh, one of the great Jewish intellectual power couples like the Himmelfarbs or, uh, uh, or uh, the Crystals, except that they were left-wing, not right-wing. Uh, so I kind of regret that. Uh, and uh, this, uh, uh, Serkin, um, uh, Serkin is probably her best-known work. She wrote about a lot of things. Her best-known work is probably Blessed is the Match, which is the history of Jewish resistance to the Nazis in occupied Europe. I want to read a short piece uh, from Serkin's, uh, uh, Serkin's diary because it gives, an impact, it gives a sense of the impact that Morris Samuel had on people, even correcting for um, late teen hormones. Um, <laughs> quote, I discovered that every poem, they're talking about walking on the Atlantic City boardwalk. I discovered that every poem that I had ever loved, he knew by heart. We walked that evening by the Atlantic Ocean, and he recited from Poe to Byron to Shelley. One had to only to mention a line, he knew the whole thing. He had a completely photographic memory, an extraordinary memory. In time, he was to dazzle James Joyce by reciting pages of Ulysses to him. Joyce, on a visit to Paris, was startled to hear someone recite pages of that fairly difficult text. In any case, he also seemed extraordinarily handsome to me. He was very nice looking, though short. <laughs> what can you do? <laughs> no, she wasn't tall, but apparently she liked her guys tall. What can you do? Okay, uh, so uh, uh, that... Uh, 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 Samuel's, um, I'm not sure love, but second and longest marriage was to Gertrude Kahn. Uh, they were married for 40 years uh, during most of Samuel's most productive years. In 1929, he took the family to then British-controlled Palestine, uh, settled the family there, and then promptly started going back and forth from Palestine to New York. Uh, and uh, conducting his very successful literary career. Uh, ultimately, they divorced. Uh, very little remains of Gertrude Kahn's uh, legacy. 
I had to go through all the stuff in the American Jewish Archive just to find a couple of pictures, this being the best one of them. I have to say, they don't look too happy even there. <laughs> and uh, I found one letter from Gertrude uh, uh, to uh, uh, the editor of the Menorah <coughs> Journal, which was a widely read journal of Jewish life in the 20s, 30s, 40s, Henry Hurwitz, in which she explains how her kids have really settled into life in Palestine and that they're very happy there and that she would never consider coming back to the United States. Interestingly enough, Mo Morris's son Gershom had a bookstore in the uh, old city of Jerusalem which was uh, open at least uh, until uh, the last couple of decades. I don't know if it still exists. But uh, 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 that was his second uh, uh, relationship. And the third uh, uh, relationship uh, uh, that uh, that I, I ought to mention is his third wife, um, Edith Brodsky uh, Samuel, who was herself uh, a literary person. She edited uh, a Jewish children's uh, magazine called Keeping Posted, and uh, her, uh, her, her role in Morris Samuel's story is that in the 60s, they got married in 61 or 62, I forget exactly which year, for the next decade, she uh, helped to promote his works, helped to support his getting out there, because his, by then his health was beginning to decline, sent his books to publishers, argued with publishers on his behalf. He wasn't a very good bookkeeper, he wasn't a very good uh, he wasn't very well organized. He wasn't a very good chorus, you know, he corresponded, but threw away his correspondence. And Edith really took over for him. And then after he died, she spent really the last decade of her life, she died in 1983, um, making sure that his works, half finished, three quarters finished, would still get published. And a couple of his works on the Bible, which I'll say a little bit more about shortly, um, it was really her work that uh, made sure that they saw the light of day. Uh, what happened um, to all of his, uh, frankly, if it weren't for Edith uh, Brodsky Samuel, uh, I believe that I would have very little to work on for Samuel other than his many published works, still the most important part of an intellectual biography, but I wouldn't have any of the archival material. I think most of that probably would have found its way into a New York City dumpster on the Upper West Side, where after many decades, um, Morris Samuel finally uh, rented an apartment on a long-term basis. Um, after many decades of living in hotel rooms. Uh, and so uh, I owe Edith a great debt uh, even though I never met her, and, um, well, okay, I won't, I won't say any more, uh, except to say that uh, it's quite possible that she did some uh, curating of the St. Morris Samuel archive, and it could be that part of the reason I have found so little on Gertrude Kahn, and, and, and not as much as I might like on Marie Serkin, and that's in her archive, not in his. Uh, maybe that Edith didn't uh, want to save that material. Okay, that also happens in real history life. Okay, the last person he had no romantic attachment with, um, Chaim Weitzman, uh, but uh, I, 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 he was a, a very important figure in Samuel's life. Uh, first, he was Samuel's chemistry teacher at the University of Manchester, and he told Samuel he ought to switch to biology. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't think... Uh, Samuel had very much talent as a chemist. It turns out he didn't have much talent as a biology a biologist either, and he, he found his true métier, which was bell letters, good writing. Um, but Weizmann then was a, a Samuel's employer. Uh, Weizmann was the head of the World Zionist Organization, certainly the most prominent Zionist figure in the first half of the 20th century worldwide, hands down. Uh, he, and, 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 and Samuel was an employee of the American branch of the World Zionist Organization, and a well-regarded one. I found one letter from James Balfour, uh, sorry, James Rothschild, right, who was an ordinary Zionist, writing Weitzman that let's not make any decision on such and such an issue until Mr. Samuel returns from his trip from, from Palestine and lets us know what the situation on the ground is like. This is from the mid-1920s. So he was a, uh, uh, I wouldn't say Weitzman's lieutenant, because Weitzman had a lot of people who were 
could more justly claim to be his lieutenant, but he was a confidant of Weizmann's. And later on, in 1947, um, he sat down with Weizmann and helped Weizmann write. Some say wrote, but I, but, but, but Samuel said no, he only helped organize and helped polish the language. But in any case, he was intimately involved with the production of Weizmann's own gripping autobiography, Trial and Error. And if you ever want to read an absolutely, well, it's a fantastic autobiography, written, obviously, uh, like all autobiographies are, from a completely self-serving point of view. <laughs> but that's, that's par for the course. So Weizmann is also really, really important in, uh, in, in uh, Samuel's life, even though they weren't married. Uh, <laughs> Now, uh, by the 1920s, uh, Samuel is a young man, he's in his mid-twenties, he's trying desperately to get noticed, as people at that age are, and he writes a couple of obnoxious books, um, which you can still find on alt-right websites, uh, because uh, Samuel, I found this out accidentally, of course, googling everything I could about Samuel, so where do you find quotes from Samuel? Uh, I'm afraid to say most of all on the alt-right websites. Um, because he writes a book, You Gentiles, he follows that up with another book called I, the Jew, and in 1932, uh, writes this book, Jews on Approval, which is a, a savage indictment of the American uh, Jewish uh, uh, leadership, uh, uh, taking particular aim at uh, Cleveland's rabbi, Abba Hillel Silver, who he considers to be the epitome of the celebrity rabbi, which he, of course, disdains probably because he would have liked to have been a celebrity. <laughs> but uh, these books are, uh, are, are, are uh, they're interesting as, uh, to follow a young, a young writer finding his, uh, finding his way. He finally does find his way, and uh, by the 1940s, he is, uh, no other way to put it, cranking out one great book after another. Um, the Great Hatred, uh, 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 and like the gentleman and the Jew, like the uh, blood accusation, just very searching uh, explorations of anti-Semitism and of the differences in Jewish and Gentile culture. Uh, the World of Sholem Aleichem, uh, this book, and uh, uh, Prince of the Ghetto, the writings of Yud Lamed Peretz, are his uh, uh, very original and very capable renderings of what you would call the Yiddish classics. Classics is a funny word to use for literature written at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, but I think they really are the Yiddish classics, and, uh, and so on. So by this point, he's a mature writer and doing very well. Uh, and, there are, and there are at least three areas that I think I'm going to write about. In other words, three chapters in this projected book. And they correspond, uh, well, those four, but there are three, and then the fourth I'll get into a little bit more in depth. Uh, the first is his role as a Zionist. He started being a Zionist advocate in the 1920s, when still the majority of American Jews were either non-Zionist or a-Zionist. They might have given money here and there, but they weren't really in any way uh, committed to the Zionist enterprise. And he keeps writing books, five in all, and plenty of articles in between, supporting the Zionist cause uh, until 1968, right after the Six-Day War. And he writes a book called Light on Israel, in which he advocates a return of the occupied territories. Again, he rem rem remains, in terms of Zionism, a figure on the left. Uh, he, ben -Gurion and he David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister, founding father of Israel, exchanged heated words about this issue, not about this issue specifically, but about um, the early state immigration policy uh, and, and basically uh, what the nature of the state should be. Uh, Morris Samuel was always a, uh, a legate of that tradition of the Chalutzim and that uh, Zionism ought to be biblically infused, it ought to be socialist infused, it ought to be uh, you know, an elite sort of enterprise and that was just in retrospect, not a very realistic position to hold uh, in light of the great ingathering that took place from 48 to around 53. Uh, but he stuck to his guns and Ben-Gurion uh, fired back. Uh, his, uh, in, so, in some respects, 
Um, his greatest contribution and the one I think that maybe the most people in the world of Jewish studies would know him for was his role as a Yiddish translator. But to say that he was a translator is to understate, I think, pretty dramatically his contribution. Not only did he render Sholem Aleichem and Yudlam and Peretz into uh, extremely readable books uh, that could be recommended to anybody, but he also translated a slew of Yiddish authors, including Isaac Bashevis' singer's older brother, including Sholem Ash, including a bunch of others who were not easy to translate and who I think would have had to wait around for doctoral students another 30 or 40 years uh, to get an English readership at a time when people reading Yiddish were disappearing. Obviously in Eastern Europe they were disappearing by being murdered. Uh, in the Soviet Union they were disappearing by what we might say was an increasingly fast pace of force Russification, I mean, initially, I don't want to get into this, there are other people in the room who could probably talk about it more. You probably know that it, initially the Soviets were not so hostile to Yiddish because it was a, a, a proletarian language, it was the language of the folk, and only gradually, as, um, as things moved on, did um, the Soviet government become increasingly hostile to Yiddish and indeed increasingly hostile to Jews. But in America, which is the more relevant site for this, Yiddish is also fading rather quickly. In other words, uh, you have the, the, if you're going to say, when is the height of Yiddish theater, the Yiddish press, I guess you put it somewhere, and I'm sorry, sorry, Ronnie's not here, she could correct me if I was off by a few years, sometime around the 1910s or 1920s, maybe 1930s, but certainly after the Second World War, the uh, Yiddish uh, in America is already in steep decline, and the fact that while this is happening, Peretz, uh, sorry, uh, Maurice Samuel is translating these Yiddish classics, I think is extremely significant. In other words, that Yiddish didn't become the preserve of every Jew who remembered a few Yiddish words they heard from their grandparents, which isn't really Yiddish, it's knowing a few words in Yiddish, it's hardly the same thing, or the province of uh, professors who get very hung up on, did Yiddish come from the Khazars, did it come from Franco-German lands, did it come up the, Dan you know, up the Danube, all these sort of academic kind of arguments. So I think it, Morris Samuel deserves an enormous amount of credit for um, uh, 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 elevating the importance of Yiddish as a serious literature. And so the fact that we now have people um, uh, studying Yiddish, reading Yiddish classics, I think owes uh, an enormous amount um, to Morris Samuel's efforts. Uh, if he's not most famous as a translator of Yiddish, uh, he's certainly most uh, famous as a polemicist. And uh, Cynthia Ozick, the novelist, who I hope most of you know and read, because she's terrific, she was, by the way, a Samuel groupie, and she writes in art and order uh, uh, collection of essays of hers from the 70s, and also in the uh, collected writings of Morris Samuel, she writes how every time she heard Samuel was speaking in the New York City area, she would rush to the uh, 92nd Street Y or to Synagogue X or Synagogue Y so she could hear Morris Samuel, this extraordinary public speaker, uh, which he was by all accounts. Nobody says otherwise. And uh, uh, Ozick, uh, 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 says, uh, you know, he was the most accomplished of all American Jewish polemicists. And so, to just give you a little sense here, uh, he took on Arnold Toynbee. Toynbee was a great fan, a great hero of the uh, English elite. He wrote a, an Oxford historian, wrote a book called The Study of History. Uh, very, very long, very, very florid, and in the opinion of Samuel and many, many others, very amateurish. Um, he uh, adopted the same tone whether he knew a lot about the subject or nothing at all, which I would say is a uh, pitfall that historians ought to avoid. Uh, in any event, uh, he really skewered uh, Toynbee, but good, in The Professor and the Fossil, arguing for the continued vibrancy of Jewish culture. In The Great Hatred, um, he wrote... Uh, that uh, people had it wrong, that the ultimate co cause 
of Christian anti-Judaism was not anger at the crucifixion and whatever role Jews did or did not play in that, but rather the very birth of Jesus. In other words, that Jesus sprang from Jewish roots. And in uh, Samuel's fairly, I think, Freudian analysis, although he doesn't talk about Freud, it's a clear <coughs> case of displacement. In other words, the Christians uh, cannot get over the resentment that Jesus is ultimately a Jewish figure. <coughs> and uh, Samuel said this, he was writing this in the 1950s, and I would say, um, uh, like any monocausal explanation for any complicated phenomena, it can't be all right. But I think there's some justice in this analysis, and I think, and here we can talk about this if you want, but I hope you'll take my word for it, that famous bumper sticker that's now fallen out of favor, my boss is a Jewish carpenter. <laughs> Some of you are old enough to remember that bumper sticker. I can just assure you that bumper sticker couldn't have been created before the Second World War. All right? The intellectual world didn't exist. And so he talked about that. And in The Gentleman and the Jew, he talked about uh, the cruelty of sports and of hunting and what he considered to be the shallow morals of Gentile culture, which he opposed not only to Jewish culture, but also to what he heard preached in churches. In other words, he thought the culture preached by Christianity was actually quite removed from the actual culture of, say, the English gentleman as practiced in reality. Now, this is a sort of essentializing argument. In other words, Morris Samuel was convinced that there was something essentially and eternally different about Jewish culture. I think that argument was wrong then. I think it's wrong now. I think in 1950, when he published this book, all he had to do was go to Yankee Stadium. This is 1950. Or Ebbets Field, both available by subway. And he could have seen that Jews were as gaga about sports as everybody else. And in fact, if you look at, uh, he grew up in Manchester, and if you want to get into a fight with an English Jew, insult Manchester United, or Manchester City, or whichever the wrong team happens to be. And in Israel, uh, uh, you know, if you're a Beitar, a Yerushalayim fan, uh, you would be very well advised, uh, you know, not to make that publicly known in other quarters. I just want to know if this was the appropriate spot to say go Astros. That's all I want. <laughs> you can say go Astros. My team's already out, so I don't really care. <laughs> you can figure out that. Okay, uh, so when I say that Samuel was the last Jewish generalist, uh, uh, the title of this talk, what I mean to say is that even though sometimes people, uh, as Jacob uh, reminded me a few days ago, sometimes people say Salo Baron, the great Jewish historian, is the last person to claim the mantle of late Jewish generalist. But I say he could only do one thing. He did it very well. Uh, Samuel could do a bunch of different things. Uh, I, what I mean by the last Jewish generalist, I mean not only that he talked about a lot of things, but he was not a mere popularizer. Not that I have anything against mere popularizers, but every area that Samuel contributed to, whether polemics, or Zionism, or Yiddish, or Bible, Samuel made a notable contribution and at least arguably um, forwarded our understanding intellectually of what these fields might actually uh, be about. So that's what I, when I say he's a, a Jewish generalist, that's really what I mean. <laughs> One more time, thanks, Katie. You know, you know, I couldn't have done this, <laughs> of course. So let me just say a few words uh, uh, before I get to, uh, uh, to the conclusion of my talk. Let me say a few words about Bible, uh, Morris Samuel's contributions to the Hebrew Bible. Um, and uh, he wrote three books. One of them only is a classic. Certain people of the book. Uh, in which he recounts great figures from the Hebrew Bible, uh, not bound by Midrash or rabbinic commentary, but also not, he's not trying to rewrite these stories in a fictionalized way. They're like interactions. They're in between commentary and, and biblical fiction. And I won't get into it too much because I want to watch my time. And so I want to show you three documents from different periods and trace what I think is both a fatal flaw in Samuel's 
orientation toward the Bible, but I think also an illuminating one. So here he writes from France. This is from the, uh, you know, this is the archival document. We have some of his letters to Marie Serkin. And he writes, it's, very, it's a very uh, elitist kind of uh, paragraph, in case you can't see it uh, too well. How can you expect the mass of people to understand the Bible? The popularity of the Bible, like that of Shakespeare, is, which he knew by heart, is one of the tragic comedies of humanity. Oscar Wilde said that he had once hoped to rescue Shakespeare from the Philistine. What can I say of the Bible when I think of the millions of the stupid who read the Bible and think they understand its message? I am appalled. Uh, the Bible is more difficult to understand than any other human right. Okay, so early on, Samuel comes to the conclusion that the Bible is this incredible document, no argument, and that it's formative not only of humanity, but most specifically of the Jewish people. I can't tell you how many dozens of times Samuel insists that the Bible uh, forged the Jewish character. And I'll just read this uh, uh, from above. Uh, uh, writing in the New Palestine, one of the many Zionist uh, uh, vehicles in the 1920s. And again, this is right from the archives, the American Jewish archives. We have a lot of Samuel's uh, writings. You can't just uh, Google New Palestine, however creative a Googler you are. Uh, but if you go to the archive, you can find it in the Hollander box. Uh, and here it is. I do not believe that anyone but a Jewess could read the Bible as Irene Trich reads it. Only a child of this people could bring again to birth those agonies which died thousands of years ago. I felt happy for them that the seeds of that all but forgotten life deepen us, but that they may someday waken again in the soil in which they are native. And here, in a very, uh, if, if, without getting into it, because I don't have the time, in a very Ahad Ha'amist kind of way, he's suggesting there is an organic connection between the land, the language, and the people. And he is claiming here, I think, and I'm pretty sure I'm right, a sort of, not monopoly on the Bible by the Jews, but a sort of an inside track on reading it correctly. How uh, is reading it in what language or languages at this point? He heard the lecture in Hebrew. He, he, he picked up Hebrew. <clears throat> he read it, he grew up in a Manchester ghetto. So he knew all of the Sidor and Bible and all the Jewish prayers nearly by, he probably knew them by heart. He had the kind of memory where he would have known them by heart. He remembered a lot of Midrashim and other folkloristic things from Cheder because he went to a Jewish day school. So he, did, he didn't have any difficulty with Hebrew reading or, or, or I doubt he had any uh, difficulty speaking. I haven't heard a tape of it, so I can't be 100% sure, but I'm 90% sure. So he hears this being read out loud in Hebrew. This was very popular in those days, in the 20s and the 30s, the out loud reading of Bible passages and so forth. This was part of the culture of the new, uh, the new culture that was taking place in Eretz Yisrael, in the land of Israel. By the way, also very popular in Germany, right? Buber and Rosenzweig and that whole crowd were also very keen on the oral, uh, and oral nature of the biblical text. Uh, so here he's making, and here I really, uh, I, I, I will just say that, that this claim uh, of uh, a Jewish a monopoly or a Jewish inside track on understanding the Bible is, is wrong, has to be rejected. And I think the interesting thing in Samuel's case is you can prove it because the two figures which seem to be uh, pivotal to his breakthrough to not just the claiming again and again how important the Bible was, but by into actually writing and speaking creatively about the Bible were two non-Jews. Thomas Mann and Mark Van Doren. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll say a little bit about each. Thomas Mann, you probably know, he was, a, I would say, inarguably the greatest German novelist of the first half of the 20th century. He wrote an awful lot of good stuff. My favorite, of course, is uh, his biblical, uh, four-volume biblical novel, Joseph and His Brothers, uh, which is not only Mann's longest work, but the one he labored at longest. Mann... Uh, uh, was a Lutheran. He grew up reading Luther Bible. Uh, a, a big day for Lutherans uh, this week in Germany. Uh, 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 he, uh, 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 he had a lot of Jewish supporters and fans. His publisher, Simon Fisher, was Jewish. His wife, Katja Pringsheimann, was partly Jewish. 
his early uh, enthusiastic reviewers for Buddenbrooks, were, or a lot of them were Jewish. So he had a lot of Jewish connections, but he was adamantly not Jewish. He wasn't really Christian either. He was an artist. He was a novelist. That was his primary identification. And um, uh, uh, what, uh, let me just say one more word about man, and then about how Amman, and then how Samuel tries to co-opt him. Uh, Amman uh, was, in fact, in the Weimar Republic, an increasingly adamant opponent of fascism. He needed to leave Germany in 33. And uh, Mann, uh, when he wrote Joseph and His Brothers, the last volume of which was written in California uh, under FDR, while well, FDR was president, and there's an awful lot of the New Deal uh, incorporated into the fourth and final uh, book of Mann's novel. Uh, Mann did use Midrash. He did use rabbinic commentary. We know this for, for sure. He was very interested in incorporating Jewish material, and he did do it in part to stick a finger in the eye of the growing anti-Semitism uh, uh, and racial madness, Rassenvan, uh, that he uh, attacked uh, quite often. But he was adamant also that his book was neither a book only for Jews, nor was it a Judenbuch in the sense that he drew only on Jewish material. He drew on Egyptian myth, he drew on 19th century novelistic traditions, and he put together this fantastic biblical novel. And, and, and so I won't get into Mon here, I will just note Samuel's review in The Jewish Frontier, written in the 1930s. Uh, he, Thomas Mann, is authentically of the group a natural convert, a Gertzedek, that means, I guess, a natural convert, a righteous convert, uh, one of those upon whose spirit the words of the first proselytizer, I assume he means Abraham, uh, who is in lore, Jewish lore, uh, famous, he and his wife Sarah, for making lots of proselytes, uh, would have fallen most fruitfully. So I want you to notice the little maneuver here, that even as he is praising Thomas Mann to the skies, it's pretty clear that Samuel is also kind of claiming he's naturalizing Mann as a Jewish writer, which is... A very, uh, it, it's a nice maneuver, but no go. Okay, but uh, Thomas Mann is a novelist. Uh, neither, uh, neither deeply Christian nor deeply Jewish. Uh, 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 but it's very clear to me uh, that his encounter with Mann liberated uh, Morris Samuel to write more freely and more creatively about the Bible. And in certain people of the book, uh, he, he, which is exactly what it says. The chapter on Joseph, he of course deals with, with Mann directly. He doesn't agree, he agrees with half of Mann. He calls, uh, Samuel calls Joseph a brilliant failure. Brilliant in his political management and his governing style, but a failure in terms of his sibling relationships. In other words, in, in Samuel's reading, Joseph's reconciliation with the brothers is never really consummated. They always remain alienated one from the other. And so he doesn't really, if you've read Mann's Joseph, so you know Mann takes a much more ironic, light, and ultimately forgiving view of Joseph and their relationship. And it, I won't get into Thomas Mann, it's my favorite. But I will say that, uh, and, and this is just one paragraph, and I'm not going to read it because I don't have time, but it's just so typical of Samuel, and he'll just pluck. And again, it's nice to have a photographic memory. I wish I did. But he was also very imaginative, and he just plucks his Benjamin Disraeli as another model court Jew, just like the original Joseph. And he goes into this extended analysis of how Disraeli and Joseph or really, should someone should write like Plutarch, parallel lives of these two careers because they match up so well and so and so fully. And I don't know. And he just does this chapter after chapter, whoops, chapter after chapter. In certain people of the book, um, he just it takes characters you think you know, and then he rereads them in a very very original way. The other person who clearly had a huge impact on Samuel's breakthrough to biblical creativity is the Pulitzer po Prize winning poet and Columbia University professor, uh, Mark Van Doren. Uh, you may not remember Mark Van Doren, but you may very well have seen Paul Schofield play Mark Van Doren 
in the excellent movie Quiz Show. I think it was one of Ray Fine's first films. In, uh, and this is based on a real life incident uh, in which there's a rigged quiz show and uh, the father, Mark Van Doren character, says, cheating on a quiz show is like plagiarizing a cartoon strip. <laughs> Mark Van Doren was truly a Mandarin uh, of the university. And they had, for 20 years on and off, a radio conversation uh, on NBC called The Words We Live By. And they would meet, and they would discuss biblical characters. And uh, I haven't yet heard the tapes, but in the beginning love, one of the books that Edith Samuel edited and published is actually little more than a, uh, record, than, than a transcription of these extraordinary uh, conversations between these two men. Uh, apparently when Columbia uh, brought them together for the first time uh, in the Upper West Side where they both lived, uh, they got together and there was supposed to be three of them in, in trialogue and Samuel is supposed to have said, I could talk to this man forever, there'll be no third. <laughs> and in fact, the two became extremely close friends, and, um, uh, uh, and they died within a year of each other. And, uh, there, and this is just one, uh, one small example from a book, which it's not quite on the level of certain people of the book, but it's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful account of a biblical dialogue being, among two first-class intellectuals who had the whole Western literary tradition at their fingertips and essentially used that Western literary tradition to illuminate the Bible. I can't think of anybody quite like that today. Maybe it would be the Zornberg in the Jewish world. I don't know in the general uh, world. Um, and here, uh, uh, Samuel is just talking about Rebecca, uh, who, if you read Genesis, you know that she is the dominant figure in the second generation of patriarchs, matriarchs. She really overshadows Isaac very dramatically, I think, if you know this story. Uh, and, and of course, Midrash, Midrash pitches around this issue. It can't really say the more important figure in the second generation is Rebecca and Isaac. That won't go. And you don't invoke Rebecca in the, uh, in, in the Amidah, in the prayers, although in Reform services, actually, you do. Uh, but Samuel here, he has no hesitation in just going ahead. And he presents Rebecca here as the masterful uh, organizer of the household, of the blessing that is transferred to Jacob, not to Esau, the elder son. And in uh, the book, the chapter in certain people of the book is called, on Rebecca, is called the manager. And Samuel, in a uh, a way that I can't do justice to, because he's a great writer and I'm not. Uh, but he manages to combine a picture of Rebecca as this proto-feminist, take-charge woman, along with the quintessential Jewish caricature, the Jewish mother as Balabuster, as the one, the super talented runner of the house. And he manages to integrate both these elements into his uh, character, uh, characterization of Rebecca. It's really just a tour de force. Certain people of the book, and when I, I, I say, how did I get interested in Samuel? I said, you know, I, I, I had reread certain people of the book, and I sent out a little thing on H. Judaic. I said, anyone interested in doing a panel on Maurice Samuel? And I got back a few dozen responses within the first 24 to 48 hours, including from some very prominent. Uh, Bible scholars, and they said, I think people of the books one of my favorite things I've ever read. Uh, uh, so let me finish up, and then there'll be hopefully some time for questions, comments, suggestions. Again, this is the first time I've presented this material. Um, I think since he didn't questionably fall down the rabbit hole of historical memory, I think it's a little bit incumbent upon me to speculate why. The first three reasons. Um, I actually are not my ideas. They are the ideas uh, of Mark Rader, uh, a historian at the University of Cincinnati, who has written uh, a, a collection and introduced and anthologized Chaim Greenberg's work. Chaim Greenberg is also in the category, like Morris Samuel, of people who have been called the other New York intellectuals. In other words, 
unlike the more famous New York intellectuals, these guys were not ambivalent about their Jewishness. They were well, they had one foot solidly planted in the ground of Eastern European Jewry. They were very alarmed by the growing gap between Jews in the land of Israel and American Jewry and wanted to fight it. These guys were not like Philip Robb and Lionel Trilling and Irving Howe, the much more famous New York intellectuals. They weren't ambivalent at all, and they were also, I might add, uh, quite well tutored in their Jewish sources, which most of the New York Jewish intellectuals, far more famous, Glad Professor Grinberg isn't here. She might take offense, but they didn't really know their uh, they didn't really know their Judaism all that well. Uh, okay, uh, the first three reasons are Mark Raiders uh, talking about Greenberg, and I agree with all of them. Um, I'd like to add uh, just a change, a sheer uh, uh, amount of change in American Jewry since 1950. The the end of an oral culture. These people used to go around the country and speak to thousands of people, hundreds of people. That was the culture they lived in, and that, that culture is no more. It's on YouTube. I guess it's still there, but it's on YouTube, and it's not in real life. Uh, the uh, gap between Israeli and American identity. In other words, uh, uh, Samuel's last uh, book while he was alive, In Praise of Yiddish, won uh, the Manger Prize in Israel. The prize was awarded posthumously at Beit Hanasi, the president's house. It was advocated by uh, 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 Rubichov, Zalman Shazar, second Israeli president. Sec okay, the second Israeli president who was named Rubichov, he changed his name to Shazar. In other words, Samuel, Chaim Greenberg, this crowd, they had readers in Israel who knew them and, and appreciated their work. That is already uh, almost, I think, a bygone era. Uh, uh, maybe the, uh, in any way, it's different. I have also another couple of reasons why uh, Morris Samuel has fallen down the rabbit hole. And that was he was not a professor with students who could do fresh shrifts for him, or a rabbi with congregants who lovingly remembered telling, you know, the great rabbi who, I was at my bar bat mitzvah, I mean, this is Abba Hillel Silver, you know, everybody in Cleveland still knows who Abba Hillel Silver is. Well, not everybody, but many people still know who he is. because. His congregation is still alive and well, and he has people who remember him firsthand. They don't remember him. They remember his son, who became rabbi after him, Daniel Jeremy Silver. And the fifth hypothesis, um, which is uh, maybe the most controversial, but I'm certainly going to forward it as hard as I can, is I think that in America, you judge American Jewish intellectuals by whether or not they've moved the needle on American culture. Since that was not Samuel's goal, he was primarily interested in contributing to Jewish culture. I just don't think that he has the purchase of other figures who I don't think are any more impressive intellectually. Thank you very much.